Good day, fellow investors. We continue with our summary on the best book out there. In chapter 8 is about the key investment tool that you must understand, and that is business valuation. We're going to touch on the key factors surrounding how to value properly a business, understand the pitfalls, avoid them, and have the right tool so that you can see whether an investment can offer value to you personally. That's the key of investing. If you enjoy these educational videos and also the stock analysis that we do, please support the channel by hitting that like button and subscribe if you haven't. We do a margin of safety video every Friday, so hit that notification bell to have it pop up in your YouTube. Let's start with the first factor that it is not a precise value, but a range of values. Because you will be wrong 100%, but... Warren and I always say, we, we cite Keynes, better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. <laughs> right? We see over and over again people who know how to use these calculators, computers now, and there's a big complicated problem with multiple inputs. Some of it can be carefully measured and some can't. So they just horribly overweigh everything that can be measured. This is truly asinine. Thanks, Charlie. So it is about understanding the volatility in the environment so that you can get value out of it. There is no precision. And the key issues when it comes to valuing a business is that seeking precision in an imprecise world is impossible. Further, business value changes over time and the problem is that formulas use assumptions where if you put garbage in, the result will be that you have garbage out and that will not be very helpful when it comes to your investing. Seth Klarman, great studier of history, of course, quotes here Benjamin Graham from The Intelligent Investor where the essential point is that security analysis does not seek to determine exactly what is the intrinsic value of a given security. It needs only to establish that the value is adequate to protect the bond or to justify a stock purchase, or else that the value is considerably higher or considerably lower than the market price. For such purposes, an indefinite and approximate measure of the intrinsic value may be sufficient. And the key words to understand here is that you have to forget about being exact, look for something that's adequate to give you a perception of value to get an approximate measure that must suffice. And this is like sex. If you tell your partner, we're going to have foreplay for six minutes, then we're going to do it for nine minutes, and then we can cuddle for six minutes again, you likely will not get much action and value out of that. But if you approach it with the flexibility, like an art, then you will likely both enjoy it. And that's the connection here, same with business valuation. Speaking of sex, a person that impollinates all over the place with uh, five kids now already is Elon Musk. But he gives us a great example of how there is a range of value even over time. Obviously, um, myself and the other investors are obviously overpaying for Twitter right now. Um, the long-term potential for Twitter, in my view, is an order of magnitude greater than its current value. So he's saying that he's overpaying now for Twitter, but that he believes that over the long term, the value he will get will be worth it. Of course, Twitter will be a different business with Elon than without Elon. So there are always differences in valuation, depending also who owns the asset and what is his time horizon. Markets exist because of differences of opinion among investors. The value of a security to the buyer must be greater than the price paid, and the value to the seller must be less or no transaction would take place. Differences emerge from differences in assumption regarding the future, Elon sees something that the sellers don't, different intended uses for the asset, and differences in the discount rates applied. 
The key to understand is no precision, but correct enough to give you a margin of safety when it comes to investing. The key with business valuation is that there is no precision, but it should be just correct enough to give you a margin of safety when it comes to investing. Let's continue with business valuation, where our goal is to buy something below its intrinsic value. And there are three useful valuation methods, net present value, liquidation value, stock market value. And the problem is that all of those will always diverge when you make an analysis. The key is that you take the most conservative one, which is available. You'll see later some will not even have a liquidation value. So you must pick between other methods. So let's start with present value analysis and the difficulty of forecasting future cash flow. Is the number that if you were all knowing about the future and could predict all the cash that a, a business would give you between now and Judgment Day, discounted at the proper discount rate, that number is what the intrinsic value of a business is. In other words, the only reason for making an investment and laying out money now is to get more money later on, right? That's, that's what investing is all about. Now, when you look at a stock, when you look at a bond, so it means the United States government bonds, it's very easy to tell them what you're going to get back. It says it right on the bond. It says when you get the interest payments, it says when you get the principal. So it's very easy to figure out the value of a bond. It can change tomorrow if interest rates change. But you are, the cash flows are printed on the bond. The cash flows aren't printed on a stock certificate. That's the job of the analyst, is to print out, change that stock certificate, which represents an interest in the business, and change that into a bond and say, this is what I think it's going to pay out in the future. Thanks, Warren. And let's go to the issues that we have when it comes to valuation. Those have to include predictions. That's already something you know you will be wrong. And also a discount rate that we will discuss again it's impossible to use a correct one from a market perspective. And now let's start with predictions. The problem with predictions is that obviously those will be wrong because we can see the future. If you can, let me know in the comments. Further, when it comes to valuation, small changes in what happens in the future have big impacts on our valuation. Therefore, you have again a very wide range of outcomes. For example, if we discuss Apple, will Apple sell phones next year? Yes, very likely. Will Apple sell more phones next year? Possible, very likely. How many more phones will Apple sell next year? That's impossible to know. But that is exactly what has the biggest impact on valuation. And very often when it comes to the growth, Investors are often too optimistic because this growth, the growth tickles your mind so strongly that you might lose a lot and take too much risk. An example of that is, of course, Cathy Wood. Many investors believed in that growth, the great research projections, everything was so great. But unfortunately, things didn't develop as planned. And we are now 77% down. And over the past five years, the performance isn't there at all. So not very good from Cathy Wood there. Unfortunately, I'm really sorry, but there was too much exuberance and too much risk taken here. And growth rates have a tremendous impact also on valuations, on the P ratio that investors are willing to pay but you must be very careful with growth rates. If we look at the P ratio of Apple, when the growth was expected to be slower within the iPhone cycle, the P ratio was extremely low. So P ratio of 10. Then investors looked, okay, this keeps on growing, growing, buybacks, everything keeps on growing. Then they were willing to pay a P ratio of 35 for the company. Now they are a little bit more concerned about the macro and everything. And then the valuation just dropped 30%. And that has huge impacts, of course, on the stock price and on your investment. In the meantime, over the last two years, earnings per share just kept going up. And Apple is a much stronger business now than it was a few years ago. But the perspective of the market changed.
And Warren Buffett says it perfectly. For the investor, a too high purchase price for the stock of an excellent company can undo the effects of a subsequent decade of favorable business developments. So we must be careful about the price paid in relation to the exuberance we put into the valuation. Now, how do value investors deal with the analytical necessity to predict the unpredictable? The only answer is conservatism and all projections have to be subject to error and if you are optimistic, you increase your investing risks. These are the key factors to think about. And to quote Klarman, investors are well advised to make only conservative projections and then invest only at a substantial discount from the valuations derived therefrom. To discuss again Apple in 2016, and I did analyze it and buy it back there, the P ratio was just 10. And when you analyze it, even at no growth for Apple, assuming no growth forever, thus being very conservative, it would have done good from an investment perspective because the P ratio was 10. Of course, there was growth, there were buybacks, so that came as a bonus on top of the quality of the investment back then. So the growth, when the P ratio was at 10, you got that for free. Now that the P ratio is 25 or 30, you are paying for that growth, which is not conservative, which is not a margin of safety. The next issue factor when it comes to valuation is the discount rate. The discount rate is the rate of interest that would make an investor indifferent between present and future dollars. The only reason we are investing is to have more in the future than what we have now. How much more is the discount rate, the investment return that tells us, okay, are we going to invest or not? If the value is bigger now than in the future, you're going to spend that money instead of investing it. So the discount rate is the differentiator there. What discount rate to use, what expectations to have, depends on the risk of the investment. The best is to always be conservative. And Klarman expresses his doubt with the risk-free rate. Let's discuss. The usual rate used for the risk-free rate and what to compare your investments is the US Treasury. This is the one-year treasury yield and you can see that in 2018 it was around 2.5 then it dropped to 0 2021 and then it went from 0 in a year to 4.5 now 4.5 4.6 that's crazy but also shows you how you cannot count something so fickle as the risk free stable rate to which compare your investments. If we stick to our Apple example, now Apple is doing 100 billion in cash flows and earnings per year. If I use a discount rate, of course, if I use zero, it would go to infinity, but let's use one. And if I use one, then at a 1% expected return, people would be happy to pay 10 trillion for Apple. However, if that discount rate goes to four, then the value there immediately crashes to 2.5 trillion, which is 75% down. So there are huge differences in the valuation outcome, depending on the growth rate you use, depending on the discount rate you use. And let's dig deeper with our intrinsic value calculation. So you can find this table for free in the link in the description below. These are just examples of stocks that we analyzed with links. And let's stick to Apple that we are analyzing here. So here you can download it and play around. The cash flow per share, the 100 billion are now at $6 per share. And you can see here the growth rate so for the first five years and then for the subsequent five years, if Apple gross earnings per share at 8% from business growth and from the buybacks, and you use an expected return discount rate of 7%, then you see that 
the valuation is around 130 per share. Okay, present value of the dividends paid out here, that's not that much relevant now. And also the terminal multiple is 20. But let's start changing this. Let's say that Apple doesn't grow at 8%, but grows at 4%. Immediately you see the intrinsic value here drop from 130 to 18. So uh, that's a big change in valuation. 130, change the growth rate, 108. If we further lower the growth rate, then again the valuation there goes even lower. So it's a big difference from an intrinsic value of 140 to 93 and we have just halved the growth rate. If we use a different discount rate, let's say 10% that it is our expected return, then the intrinsic value is even lower. So I prefer using this just as an indication and also as a comparative insight into the valuation of a business. Of course, you can download this in the link in the description below and play around. I'll also put the link explaining the net present calculation value and how it works in the description below. So if you want to learn more about that tool, that's just an indication again, feel free to use it. It's completely free. Apart from making your own net present value calculations, you can also use private value. Private market value is an indication of what other rich investors, big funds or something like that have paid to own, let's say, this wind farm. So if they paid that much, they might pay again. So if you can buy below that, it is also an indication of how to value a business. But you must be very careful. You must forget private market value in exuberant markets because it is often a self-fulfilling prophecy. People pay more and more and actually destroy value in the long term. So you better focus on conservative historical standards. A great example that we just discussed by analyzing Adobe is that they paid 50 times sales for Figma. 50 time sales. Of course, the deal was made in the exuberance of the tech boom, but hopefully it will be valuable for Adobe. On the other hand, if we think about private market value, Berkshire Hathaway acquired Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway in 2009, 2010. So that's what they did, paid valuation at 34 billion, 18 times estimated recession earnings for a railroad, so likely 10 times real earnings. And you can see that he paid 34 billion and immediately took out 2.25 billion in just dividends, which is then a 7.5 dividend yield private value. Now these railroads are trading at dividend yields of a few percentage points. This is conservative historical value that you can use as an example. Klarman, however, gives a great insight and his personal rule is that investors should value businesses based on what they themselves, not others, would pay to own them. So what would I pay to own this windmill farm? If each windmill here gives me 50K a year, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, likely here the 10th, half a million a year. And the question is how much would you pay now to get half a million a year in cash flows? Pretty certain, especially if there is a contract already sold, everything pre-sold depending also on the wind, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start thinking with your own mind about owning businesses. That's the best business valuation method out there. So we have discussed net present value analysis. Let's now discuss liquidation value. And liquidation value is very interesting because it is old school value investing, hard to apply now because it focuses on tangible value and 
it is the ultimate investing reality. This is where the whole investment turns into cash and tells you the real value. Unfortunately, it is hard now for retail investors to discuss and approach something from a liquidation value because most of the businesses now are light asset businesses. And given also the speed of the technological improvements, even if there are assets valuable on the balance sheet, what is on the balance sheet that we'll discuss later in the book value analysis might not be realistically there. The tech might be obsolete. So it's very, very hard to discuss this except for special situations. And another valuation method for special situations is stock market value. That can be used when it comes to the valuation of a potential spin-off within a company then you compare what are similar businesses trading at and then you can estimate the value of that spin-off from that stock market value perspective. Of course, the value of a closed-end fund that can be actually also liquidated can be measured through the stock market value. And keep in mind, this is just one of the many valuation tools that can be helpful here and there. Of course, when it comes to choosing among valuation methods, if you focus on the net present value, it's great for valuing a high return business with stable cash flows, such as a consumer products company or the utility we discussed. When it comes to liquidation value, it is the best for unprofitable businesses trading below book value, and we'll discuss book value in a second. When it comes to stock market value, closed end funds and spin-offs, of course. The message is use all and always be extremely conservative, wait for the right pitch to invest. The next valuation factor to consider is reflexivity and that is sourced from the alchemy of finance from George Soros showing again how Klarman is an avid learner and reader and this was actually the first investment book that I read when I was 13. Took me seven reads to understand it, but it's a great book I recommend. And when it comes to reflexivity, what is reflexivity? Well, fundamental analysis seeks to establish how underlying values are reflected in stock prices, whereas the theory of reflexivity shows how stock prices can influence underlying values. And that is a wild card phenomenon. And here we can explain it and then we'll discuss Tesla and as an example. As earnings rise, stock prices follow and then the business can take advantage of these stock prices to improve the fundamentals even more. Consequently, when it has been overdone, earnings per share will start declining but if the business needs to issue more shares here, it will have a negative impact on fundamentals itself over time. And the great example there is Tesla. So even if Elon Musk has assured investors he did not plan to raise additional capital back in the years, in 2020, he raised 12 billion. Why did he do that? Well, he simply took advantage of an amazing stock price that allowed him to build amazing fundamentals and compete with the auto industry. So if we just take a look at Tesla's stock price, it boomed in 2020 and then Musk pushed for capital raises to get more money because just pushing 1% on the market capitalization of a trillion or something like that wasn't diluting shareholders, but was allowing to create amazing fundamentals. And this is the perfect example of reflexivity, how high stock prices improve the fundamentals. The high stock prices allowed Tesla to <laughs> attack Germany's auto establishment, change the rule desk, significantly improve fundamentals and have enough money to finance all the ideas over the next few years, no matter what happens to the stock price now. Incredible strategy there and a great example of reflexivity. On the negative side, if we look at how many stocks were issued secondary offerings during the 
crisis, the pandemic crisis, you can see that when stock prices were low in 2020, companies issued shares to survive at low stock prices, diluted even more existing shareholders. And that's an example of how negative share prices have a significant impact on the stock prices and the real value per share over time. So always keep in mind, reflexivity cannot be used all the time, but in the 10% of cases, it has a huge impact. And it is always to keep in mind how what's going on in the market can change actually the fundamentals that you are actually analyzing. Therefore, it is an essential tool to always think about when it comes to valuation. The next topic are conventional valuation yardsticks, earnings and earnings growth, book value and dividend yield. Let's start with earnings and earnings growth. The first thing to understand, it's an imprecise measure. It's subject to manipulation and accounting vagaries. And as with any prediction of the future, earnings are nearly impossible to forecast. We just discuss the manipulation. There have been many ways of doing earnings manipulation, but the latest is buybacks. And we discussed this in a recent video where Mark Cuban says that buybacks are everything wrong with what companies do. And if we see what Klarman is saying, corporate managements are generally aware that many investors focus on growth in reported earnings and the number of them gently message reported earnings to create consistent upward trend buybacks. A few particularly unscrupulous managements play accounting games to turn deteriorating results into improving ones. That's what, for example, retailers are trying to do now in the environment. Losses into profits and small profits into larger ones. So it is important to remember that the numbers are not an end in themselves. Rather, they are a means to understanding what is really happening in the company. The next factor is book value. And book value is the historical accounting of shareholders' equity. It is impacted by share issuance and buybacks. And you must look beyond the numbers to understand this. Let me give you an example. Let's say we built a building 20 years ago and we spent a million dollars. Depending on the city and with interest rates going lower, in 2021, that building might have been valued at 100 million. Now, with interest rates higher, that building, let's say, is, can be sold for 50 million. So, still good, but let's look at the accounting perception. If you look at that building after 20 years with 5% depreciation per year, the value of that building on the books could be now zero. This is what would a conservative accountant do? Zero. Keep in mind that number. On the other hand, we have many REITs that own businesses and they constantly revalue those businesses or if they paid a hundred million for that same building in 2021, that building that's now valued at 50 million would be a hundred million on their book value. And all those revaluations also impact their earnings. So never trust a REIT's earnings. Always look for funds from operation and then see how much would you pay for this building. So the focus is you really need to look beyond the numbers to see the real value, to find what's the real value for you, not just take book value at face value. That's always wrong. And let me know here if you want me to discuss book value and how many companies now have negative book value because of the buybacks and how it impacts that. I'm looking forward to your comments on that. Further on book value, Technology gets obsolete, uh, buildings get obsolete, you have to change, you have to invest, and therefore it's, again, always a message is to look beyond. Now, on dividend yields, Seth Klarman says, why such a short discussion on dividend yields? Well, it's very simple. Dividends are, yes, very important when it comes to investing, but are just one part of how a business can create value for shareholders. They can reinvest for growth, 
they can repurchase shares and they can pay dividends. When it comes to valuations, you have to focus on how the businesses creates value over time and not just on one part. There can be many businesses that will pay a dividend just for manipulation, etc. So be very careful not to focus just on the dividend yield, but look beyond the dividend yield and look at the complete picture. Conclusion, always great to read from Klarman, succinct and to the point. Business valuation is a complex process yielding imprecise and uncertain results. Many businesses are so diverse or difficult to understand that they simply cannot be valued. Some investors willingly voyage into the unknown and buy into such businesses, impatient with the discipline required by value investing. Investors must remember that they need not swing at every pitch to do well over time. Indeed, selectivity undoubtedly improves an investor's result. For every business that cannot be valued, there are many others that can. Investors who confine themselves to what they know, as difficult as that may be, have a considerable advantage over anyone else. I hope you enjoyed this. Check my other Seth Klarman videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.